In this video, we're computing an infinite series for the inverse tangent function, and we're going to do this by way of kind of a trick. We're going to recognize a geometric series that we can integrate term by term in order to arrive at the series for the inverse tangent. This is in contrast to computing the Maclaurin coefficients by brute force, and I'm also recording a video on that today, and I'll post a link to that real quick. So there's kind of a bonus question as well. We're asked to show the series converges at x equals 1, and then use that value of x to write pi as an infinite series. And we can kind of get a clue why this is possible, because if I evaluate the inverse tangent function at x equals 1, that's the angle whose tangent is 1, which is pi over 4, and we can just multiply that result by 4 to get pi. So let's get started. And I want to start with a little note about the derivative of the inverse tangent function. The derivative of the inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared, and this fits the form of a geometric series. So just a little reminder of what we've said in the past about geometric series. So I've typically written them starting from n equals 1. And if I plug in that n equals 1, I get a as my first term. Plug in n equals 2, and I get a, r, and so on. OK, so that's a geometric series with a common ratio of r. And we proved that this adds up to a over 1 minus r. And that a over 1 minus r looks very similar to this 1 over 1 plus x squared. It's just an issue of manipulating it a little bit to highlight what the r is. And then the a is clearly 1 in the numerator. So I've rewritten it as 1 over 1 minus negative x squared. Now there's an important point here about convergence. When does the geometric series converge to this sum? And we showed that it works if the absolute value of r is less than 1. Well, if we apply that to our geometric series for the derivative of the inverse tangent, that's guaranteed to converge if the absolute value of negative x squared is less than 1. The minus sign, of course, doesn't matter. And when is the absolute value of x squared less than 1? That happens when the absolute value of x is less than 1. So we're guaranteed to get convergence provided the absolute value of x is less than 1. Unfortunately, we're interested in plugging in x equals 1 at some point, so it's going to require a separate proof of convergence. So let's express our derivative of the inverse tangent function as an infinite series, and all we have to do is plug in that r is equal to negative x squared. I can pull a factor of negative 1 out of this, and that gives me negative 1 to the n minus 1, and then an x to the 2n minus 2. So the derivative of the function that we're interested in turns out to be equal to this infinite series. And now all I do is just integrate both sides. That would give me an inverse tangent of x on the left-hand side. It also gives me an arbitrary constant of integration. And then I just integrate each term in my infinite series. So I add 1 to the exponent on x. This is just the power rule. And I divide by that resulting exponent. It's also possible, if you prefer to work with the expanded series, that we could have written the series for the derivative of the inverse tangent by plugging in several values of n and expanding it to get a little better intuition for what's going on. And when I plug in n equals 1, I don't get a minus sign on that term because the exponent of negative 1 would be 0. And I get x to the 0, or 1, out of that. When I plug in n equals 2, the exponent of negative 1 now becomes odd, and I get a negative term. And the exponent of x becomes 2, so I get x squared. In my third term, I get a positive result because I have negative 1 to the second power. And I'll get x to the fourth out of that. And now I can see the pattern. So we could have integrated it in expanded form. And using the power rule on every term, I get c, that's an arbitrary constant of integration, plus x minus 1 third x cubed plus 1 fifth x to the fifth, and so on. And that's exactly the same thing you get if you just plug in n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on into the infinite series representation. So we've got to deal with that little constant c. And the way you deal with this is just by using the fact that the inverse tangent of 0 that's the angle whose tangent is 0. So I know that's equal to 0. But if I look at the right-hand side, subbing in x equals 0, I get c. So I just found out that c is 0, and I don't have to worry about it. So we arrive at our infinite series representation of the inverse tangent function. But this conclusion was all based on the convergence of a series where I'm only totally confident it converges if the absolute value of x is less than 1. Now what I want to do is evaluate it at x equals 1, and I'm not sure whether or not this thing is going to converge. So here's the plan, and then we'll move to a new slide to test the convergence. I know that the angle whose tangent is 1, that's pi over 4. So pi over 4 is going to be equal to the angle whose tangent is 1. Subbing in x equals 1, I find that pi over 4 is going to be the sum of negative 1 to the n minus 1 over 2n minus 1. 
but I'm not sure it's going to converge. So we're going to go into the alternating series test. And this thing is definitely a close relative of the alternating harmonic series, which I already know converges. So I'm pretty confident that it's going to work out. The first thing we have to show is that the size of the terms goes to zero in the large n limit. And there's really nothing to do here. I can see that the denominator is getting infinite. The numerator is staying finite. So this limit definitely goes to zero. And we've passed that test. The next thing we need to show is that the next term is always less than or equal to the previous term. So I'm going to write those two terms down and just compare them. Here's the n plus 1 term. And to get a real clear comparison here, I'm going to go ahead and find my nth term in that. When I distribute the 2, that's a 2n minus 1 and then plus a 2. And the reason I did it that way is because 1 over 2n minus 1, that's the nth term, a n. I can see this has a larger denominator than that, so it's clearly less than. 1 over 2n minus 1. So we passed that test. So this was, again, a case where we were kind of right on the edge of the interval of convergence, so we had to do a separate test for convergence. We've now verified that this series does converge, so there's no problem there. And we already showed that it's equal to pi over 4. Now if I just multiply both sides by 4, I have an infinite series representation for the number pi. So there it is in sigma notation, but it might be more intuitive to expand it and look at the first few terms. Sub in n equals 1, and I get a 1 out of that. Sub in n equals 2, and I get a negative 1 third. Sub in n equals 3, and I get a positive 1 fifth, and I can see the pattern now. Minus 1 seventh, plus 1 ninth, and so on and so on. So if we take all those fractions and add them all up and multiply by 4, we get pi. And we're done. If you find the math content on Zach's Lab helpful, click on the Zach's Lab logo on the right to browse playlists and subscribe to the channel. I produce dozens of new videos per month, and subscribing is the easiest way to find new content. Thanks for watching.